Well, today we start our new series called Carols of the Season. And the reason we call it that is because each week we're going to take a different Christmas carol and use it to illustrate either in a very small way or a very large part of the study uh, the particular principle that we're discussing on that particular day. It is a series every year that's exciting to me uh, when we do our Christmas series because of the fact that our, some of our other pastors are involved in the series and gives us that opportunity just to get insight from different people, get a different vantage point as we make our way through the different aspects of study. And so I'm excited to hear from them uh, beginning next week. We're going to carry this study, actually, even though it is our Christmas study, and David and Linda Smalley, sorry to interrupt things, great to see you, it's just a surprise. Uh, both coming back from surgery, my goodness. Uh, it uh, lost my train of thought, thank you very much. Um, it's, it's, um, it's interesting the way things are going to roll out because I um, have no clue. I really have absolutely no clue what I was going to say. So David, you and Linda, since you did that, you come up and... Uh, Say it again. Oh, thank you very much. Somebody remembers that stuff. Okay, so we're going to take this actually to the last Sunday before the new year begins, which, by the way, is after Christmas, as you well know. But uh, you're going to see how that plays in very importantly to the Christmas series, how this last aspect, the last part that we draw on in Advent comes to play such a significant role uh, with our Christmas series. So I'm excited to see this lay itself out. Uh, in your bulletin, you'll find a study guide. If you would grab that out, grab a clipboard and a pen from the book rack, and uh, let's get into this, because today we're going to be discussing, as you've already heard, the, the aspect of hope. Hope. Now understand what hope is. Some people view hope as that which is uh, is, is not guaranteed, but they, they are at least hoping that it will happen. But when the Word of God talks about hope, it's talking about something that you can expect to happen. In the Old Testament, when the people were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, there was a hope inside of them. Not that maybe it will take place. But they, they were expectantly looking for that which was promised because they knew it was going to come. The song the choir sang is our carol for the day, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It was written in the 12th century. It literally laid out a prayer for the children of Israel. And it indicated that time which... They were looking for the Messiah to come. And it speaks so clearly of what was going on with the children of Israel during this time. Let me just read to you the first verse. It says, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Now this is not just words to fit the poem, but this is, this is a prayer. This is a plead. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. It is true that the time in which Jesus was to be presented to the world, uh, Israel was in captivity. They were in captivity to the Roman Empire who had such a massive army, such brutality and strength and force that they easily swept through the known world at that time and possessed it. You, their possessions, your land, it belonged to the Roman government. So if they said you are to move, you packed your stuff and moved. If they said you are to work, you got ready and you went to work. If they said you are to do without, you did without. Because what the Roman government said was law for you. You were in submission to the Roman government. But even more than that, the captivity extended beyond that which was physical and went to that which was spiritual because they were in such captivity to their sin, to the rebellion against God. If you go back into the pages of the Old Testament, you find that the children of Israel had turned their backs on God to the extent that God for 400 years had been silent. 
God was not speaking to them through his word. He was not speaking to them through the prophets. He was not speaking to them through the judges, through the kings, through whoever else. God was silent. Now, can you imagine what that would be like? Some of us who are, are, are searching for God, we're, we're seeking God in things that are going on in our lives, we've found from time to time for God to be silent while He's growing us, He's developing us, He's preparing us. And, and that, that few days or few weeks or few months or maybe even a few years, it, it seems like a lifetime and it's so horrible to be in that situation where you're not hearing from God, where you're not communicating with God. The children of Israel had gone 400 years without hearing from God. And yet the scary thing for them is it was almost like they didn't even notice. They had so convinced themselves that their way was right. That what they were doing was what God wanted them to do. Everything they were doing, even though it was pursuing their own lust, pursuing their own desires, making themselves out to be God, their possessions to be God, even though this was what was reality, they had convinced themselves that really this is what God wants from us. And they were held captive by their sin. Now unfortunately that's not something that only applies to the children of Israel. And it doesn't only apply to them during this time in which we're discussing. But in fact it applies to every person who's ever lived. We all leave the womb captive to our sin. We all find ourselves in such bondage to the rebellion against God. A lot of people never find their way out of that bondage. A lot of people are still wrapped up. They're still tied up in that bondage. And the very scary thing is if they die in that bondage, not only will they never be freed from it, but they will pay the price of their sin, of their rebellion for all of eternity and never satisfy the debt. Never. But what about the rest of us? Does that mean that somehow we have achieved this level of perfection that no one else can? Does that mean that somehow we've mastered the art of service to the degree that our good outweighs our bad and therefore we don't have any problems when it comes to eternity because naturally we're, we're what God is looking for? No, it's not what that means. Same rules apply. We've all sinned. We've all rebelled against God. We've all fallen short of God's glorious standard, which, by the way, is perfection. None of us measure up to that. And as a result, we are all lost. We are all helpless. And we are all hopeless. And yet in such hopelessness, in such a time of desperation. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 says, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. Now the easy way to wrap this whole thing up is just simply to say, when it says a son is given, just replace the word son with hope. That, that expectation that it will occur just as promised. For to us, a son or hope is given. Throughout the course of my studies in preparation for this particular day, I have found these two phrases to be more meaningful to me this year than ever before. I mean, for some reason, even though I've studied these verses many times, I've spoke on them many times, for some reason in this particular year, in this particular study, God has taken these two phrases to a whole new level for me. Just excitement and, and understanding of what God is doing. 
And this morning, if you will allow me, I just want to take those two phrases and build on them and hopefully be able to transfer to you some of the excitement that God has given to me. Some of the concerns, yes, but some of the excitement that God has given to me as we move forward. Number one, I want you to see first of all the unnoticed blessing. The unnoticed blessing. For to us, a child is born. Now, all of mankind knew that children were born. It's no surprise that it happened millions of times up until this point. It had happened millions of times since that point. None of us are surprised that someone would say, for just a child is born. Wow, that's great. But that's where the excitement would have ended. Because the people of that day and time weren't looking for a child. They were looking for Messiah. They were looking for a warrior. They weren't looking for someone who was little and couldn't care for himself. They were looking for someone who would come and do what they needed, and that was bring about the freedom of their captivity. In their minds, the only problem they had was their captivity to the Roman government. Their captivity to sin did not seem to be an issue because they had so convinced themselves that what they were doing was right. Every person was following their own lust, following their own desires. And they had made themselves believe that this was okay. This was what God was looking for from them. So when it was announced that the baby was born in Bethlehem, most everyone missed it. Most everyone. Jesus was born unnoticed. The Bible tells us in first, or excuse me, John chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. It wasn't who they were looking for. Verse 11, he came to his own people, and even they rejected him. I got to thinking about this unnoticed blessing. And I thought, you know what, there is something incredibly special about this child that was born. The world missed it. People today still miss it. They don't understand the significance of the birth of Jesus Christ. They don't understand why we celebrate this time of year uh, for, for the fact that we are celebrating Jesus' birthday. They don't get that. They, they miss it. It's unnoticed and unrecognized to them. But as I thought through what Jesus would do, and I, I thought about how Jesus would interact with mankind, the blessings that Jesus would bring up on the world through his appearance and his time on earth, it, it became a wow experience for me. Now, even if the people in that day and time could have looked ahead and said, well, this is all that Jesus is going to do when he's here. Look at all these different things. Even if someone could have showed them that, I don't believe they would have accepted it. And the reason I say I don't think they would have accepted it because then later as Jesus grew up and as these things began to happen in his ministry, they actually saw them, physically saw them happening and still wouldn't accept it. And yet these things were so significant. I made a list of just a few of them. I want to read that list to you. He was the one who was miraculously born of a virgin. He was the one who was announced by an angel, first to his mother, then to his earthly father, and then to a group of shepherds who were taking care of their sheep that night that Jesus was born. He was the one that the wise men, probably kings from the east, traveled from such a great way off to see and to give gifts. He was the one that John says in John 1.14 that he was the word that became flesh and lived among us. John said with great excitement in his voice, we observed his glory. The glory as the one and only son from the Father, full of grace and mercy. Can you hear the excitement in John's voice? We got to see him. We got to see him. While all others were, not, were missing him, it was an unnoticed event to them. John was excited. 
John said in verse 17 of John 1 that Jesus was God's unfailing love and faithfulness. Jesus was the one who came to baptize with the Holy Spirit. The one that John the Baptist wasn't even worthy to stoop down and unlatch the, the, the buckles on his sandals. He was the one who caused the blind to see, who made the lame to walk, who allowed the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. The one who simply spoke to, to a person or groups of people who were so controlled and overwhelmed by a deadly disease known as leprosy. And when he spoke to them, the Bible says that the leprosy disappeared from their bodies. Jesus was the one who spoke to the dead and Miraculously, the dead came back to life. He was the one who, according to the last chapter of John, did so much to bless mankind during his 33 and a half years here on earth that if everything he did was written down in books, the world could not contain all of the volumes that would be written. He was the one that it is said of him that his kingdom will never end. He is the one who is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is the child who would grow up to be a man that would carry the sin of the world on his body. He was the one who would carry that sin to the cross. The one that would stretch out his hands and be nailed there. The one who would suffer there, who would be humiliated there, who would be forsaken there, and who would die there to pay the price of our sin so that we, you and me, might be freed from the judgment and wrath of Almighty God which is to come. And we might be freed from the sin and the shame and guilt that weighs us down. This is the child that was born that night in the little city of Bethlehem. This is the one who brought such great blessings upon mankind, but somehow, somehow, remained unnoticed by the majority of people. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Number two. We see that there was the unnoticed blessing given from the unappreciated giver. Number two, the unappreciated giver. The unappreciated giver. To us... A son is given. Unfortunately, that little phrase falls on most of us without much thought being put into it. A son is given. He's literally saying God gave his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his son. And yet there's a couple of issues with that that mankind has. For the children of Israel, as I said, that's not what they were expecting. Their problem in their minds as they saw it was that they were in captivity to the Roman government. They desperately needed a warrior. They needed one who was skilled in war to come and fight the battle to free them from their oppression. That's all they needed. They certainly didn't need a baby in a manger that couldn't care for himself. They didn't need a baby that was born to poor parents. They didn't need a baby that, that would have to struggle and fight to make his way through society because he was at the bottom. It's not what they needed. They needed one that would deliver them from their captivity. For us, as we look at it, and people in our day and time we would think more logically, you know what? How ridiculous does this story sound? I mean, this is God who gave His Son. That's what you're saying, God. If we believe that God exists, then for us to think that God would literally give His Son, how, how ridiculous that sounds. He would send Him to the earth as a baby, a poor child, that would be rejected by His own people, that would be 
beaten and spat upon, that would be despised and rejected of men, that would be nailed to a cross and would die. You know, I would never do that to my child. Never. How could I imagine that God would? And yet the promise in the book of Isaiah was that a son will be given. A son will be given. How amazing. We would think, well, there's got to be another way, right? I mean, there's got to be the availability of something else at God's disposal. He has everything in his possession. Surely he could come up with an alternate way of accomplishing the, the mission of saving people from their rebellion against him. Surely there's something else. And yet, the righteousness and the holiness and the justice of Almighty God demands a payment for sin and that payment is always death. Always death. That's why if we die in our sin, if we die uh, trying to pay for our sin on our own, we not only will not pay for it in this life, but we will literally spend eternity trying to pay for it. Because the sacrifice, the death, is not sufficient to accomplish payment for our sin. We will literally spend eternity paying the price of that sin and we will never satisfy the debt. Never satisfy the debt. You look at that and say, well, where's the hope in this message? The hope is that Jesus Christ, in obedience to his Father, came to this earth and paid the price for us on the cross of Calvary. Jesus died in our place. Jesus stepped into the history books with the purpose of obedience to God to stretch out His arms to carry the sin of the world upon Him, to have the judgment and wrath of Almighty God poured out upon Him on the cross of Calvary, and there He would fully satisfy the debt for our sin. So that if we would believe in Him, if we would accept that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and if we would accept that Jesus died in our place, and that God accepted His sacrifice by raising Him back to life three days later, that we can be saved. So many people never appreciate the giver. May we not be in that group. May our hearts overflow with gratitude to God for the sacrifice of His Son. So what do we do with information like this? You know, it's my prayer, it has been throughout the course of this study, that God would give us a time of thanksgiving today. That thanksgiving wouldn't be something that we have happen once a year, but would be something as a result of an understanding of God's mercy and kindness to us would last throughout the year. And especially now as we draw close to the time of the birth of Christ in which we at least celebrate that birth. That our hearts would be turned even more so to this thankfulness for God's sacrifice of His Son. And that that gratitude, that thankfulness would be that which would draw us closer to God would cause us to say, you know what? I, I just, out of thankfulness, I want to serve Him. I, I want to be closer to Him. I want to know Him more. For others who you don't know Christ as your Savior, then my, my prayer for you is that this information has caused you to wake up and understand that. 
cause you to see maybe for the first time, maybe again, that you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so this morning, what I'm asking you to do, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand. Jason and the musicians will come and the worship team. And that's going to introduce us into a time of invitation where I'm asking you to do what God's asking you to do. And as God is speaking to your heart, that you will respond to Him. If that's for gratitude, that you just pause or you come and find a spot and say, God, thank you. Thank you for your Son. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, that this morning you're going to make your way to the aisle that's closest to you and you're just going to come and meet me here at the front and say, Tom, I want to know more about Jesus. Would you do that today?